When I posted my video on the 10th foundational falsehood of creationism, a lot of people were interested in my use of what looked like a phylogeny explorer program. I've received several dozen requests for that software, but sadly that database does not yet exist. It was just an animation created to illustrate what is often an otherwise difficult concept to explain. I've had many requests to create it, and some have even volunteered their assistance getting it started, but it can't be produced easily or quickly in our spare time, not if we were to do it justice. Were I offered adequate funding, I would gladly devote my life to constructing the ultimate catalog of evolutionary phylogeny. Others have tried. For example, Miko's Phylogeny Archive is an impressive volume of work, full of citations and references, and has been occasionally updated for many years, but it is still unfinished. It still contains errors and is not peer-reviewed, which the author points out himself, much to his credit. Paleos.com was another vast and encompassing project. It was a splendid online encyclopedia for anyone interested in evolution, paleontology, or systematics, and it was full of data depictions and artwork that were unavailable anywhere else. Sadly, that project was also an unfunded private venture. It no longer exists in its original grandeur, although a few skeletal remnants of it have been converted to a wiki. That leaves the Arizona Tree of Life project as the best phylogeny primer available online. It is easy to navigate and is nicely illustrated and was even peer-reviewed back when it was still being created, but it too is unfinished. It was never as complete as Miko's work, nor anywhere near as rich as Paleos, and it has been in need of significant updates since the 20th century. The human genome was completely sequenced in 2003, eight years after the last update to this page. Since then, we have sequenced many more genomes and have learned much more than we ever could have from morphology alone. Most of the new data confirms what we already knew, of course, but there were a few corrections and a couple surprises. First of all, as we learned in a previous video, pangolins are actually nested among carnivores and creodonts. Edentata turned out to be polyphyletic and was consequently recategorized as the superorder Xenartha. Remember that we also learned in an earlier video in this series that ferre is closely associated with condylarths and hoofed animals. Horses and aardvarks had to swap places, too, because it turns out that aardvarks are more closely related to elephants and manatees, and that they all belong together in another superorder which is not as closely related to other hooved animals as carnivores and pangolins turned out to be. Two other Eutherian superorders were identified, Laurasiotheria and Euarchontogliers. Of course, the latter of these is made of gliers and archontids. There were changes here, too. Dermoptera turned out to be closer related to primates than Scandinia, which isn't surprising, given the hypothesized relationship between primates, flying colugos, and bats. But now that we've sequenced a few bat genomes, the surprising thing is that they turned out not to be as closely related as we once thought. They're not even archontids. They're in a different superorder, being more closely aligned with insectivores. This was a point of contention in taxonomy for some time. If we had only microbats to look at, we probably would have classified them correctly, but there are megabats too, and they look quite different. They're so much like basal primates inside and out that it was once thought that they might even be primates. Megabats seem to have more in common with colugos than they did with microbats, so it was even argued that Chiroptera was polyphyletic and that both groups evolved independently, convergently. Now we know that they are monophyletic and that the convergent form is actually the colugo. Tracing genetic orthologs allows us a means of confirming and, if necessary, correcting taxonomic trees that were previously constructed on morphological homologies alone. So the more we learn about comparative genomics, the more these relationships will be precisely defined. Now let's get ourselves in order and see how genomic analyses line up with each other, with homologies, and with the fossil record. The earliest primate fossils date to 56 million years ago, less than 10 million years after the demise of the dinosaurs, but they certainly didn't look much like primates yet. At that time, they, like the microbats, were barely distinguishable from shrews. Modern tree shrews are a sort of living fossil, being a karyotype of the earliest ancestors of both rodents and primates. That's why Disney rendered theirs so squirrel-like. They're about as generalized as it is possible for a placental mammal to be. Everything from aardvarks to zebras were derived from similar stock, and so were we. So onto this template we will fix the definitive traits of primates, and on the modified template we will add more specific traits for each of the descendant subsets. There are two distinct forms of primates, a relatively primitive, apparently basal branch, and another group increasingly advanced. Long before we discovered genetics, we knew these two groups must be related, but we had no fossils to link them until we finally found this one from 47 million years ago. 
Now that we've connected the wet nose primates to the dry nose primates, we focus back on our own branch. The next division is between tarsiers and anthropoids, meaning human-like primates, and of course that includes humans. This clade has another name too. Traditionally, it was called simiforms, meaning the monkey group. The earliest monkeys appeared in the fossil record around 34 million years ago and immediately divided into the New World and Old World varieties. The New World monkeys actually retain more primitive traits, while the Old World monkeys are comparatively modern by our standards. Propliopithecoidea are the earliest Old World monkeys to appear in the fossil record some 33 million years ago. We can't sequence their genes other than through their evident descendants in the current sister groups of Circopithecoidea and Hominoidea. The hominoid group divides again between the lesser apes, being gibbons and siamangs, and the great apes, which of course includes humans. Now, as it was with ancestral monkeys, we had lots more species of apes in the fossil record than we have now, just like we had lots more species of human than we have now. We can't sequence their genes either, but the relationships we'd expect them to confirm are already obvious. Creationists believe that Australopiths shouldn't be classified as homoenes, humans, despite our nearly identical morphology and obvious evidence of evolution, owing to some imagined genetic barrier, the last ditch of the desperate in denial. Of course, they say this having to ignore the Molecular Phylogeny of Living Primates published by the Public Library of Science, which exactly confirms our position amongst the great apes and our genetic proximity to chimpanzees, which we had already determined by other means. We're so close to chimpanzees that it might still be possible to produce living hybrids. Using laboratory techniques, we've done it with more distantly related species than that, but no one has yet conclusively determined whether we're still chemically interfertile with chimps or not. No one really wants to prove it either, because most of us don't even want to know the answer to that question. So it is still safe to call chimpanzees a different species, regardless whether we could interbreed with them or not. But all this implies that fertility between much more human-like Australopiths and primitive men was a virtual certainty. All right, but you're so damned ugly. Genomics not only confirm our phylogeny, but the evolutionary mechanisms involved as well. For example, beneficial mutations have been precisely defined and positively identified. Some of these have been shown to increase complexity and even add new genetic information, depending on how you define that. But beneficial mutations were the result of genetic deletions, too. While studying human-specific loss of regulatory DNA and the evolution of human-specific traits, scientists were able to isolate 510 deletions from the ancestral primate genome, which also caused significant regulatory changes, including, among other things, improvements in the sexual characteristics of monogamous mates. Even the expansion of specific regions of the human brain can be correlated to a deletion of genes from the primate genome. First of all, this is a loss of a gene, a loss of information. Gee, notice a trend here? Yes, the obvious implication is that having a couple chromosomes fused or having certain genes deleted does not necessarily equate to having less genetic information. Here we see again that creationist arguments are consistently always wrong. How many more ways can we prove that and prove it conclusively? Here's my favorite way. Creationists usually accept that taxonomy is superficially accurate, but they'll only concede that to a degree, because they insist that their god miraculously conjured a series of definitely different kinds of animals which were each specially created separate from each other. Creationists allow that each of these kinds have since diversified, but only within mysterious limits which they refuse to rigidly define and they say that no lineage could ever be traced beyond their alleged original archetypes. However, they're unable to identify what those kinds are, how many there are, or how they could be recognized. I would challenge them to show me their mystic divisions amongst the following taxa. Are mallards related to pockards, wood ducks, and muscovies? Are all ducks also related to geese and other anseriforms? Are anseriforms related to galliforms and other neonates? Are neonates related to paleonates? Are any extant birds related to Hesperornis, Ichthyornis, Enantiornis, or other Euarnites? Are Euarnites related to Confuciusornis or Archaeopteryx? Are all early aves related to Microraptor, Velociraptor, or other non-avian dinosaurs? Are dinosaurs related to Pterosaurs, Phytosaurs, and other Archosaurs? 
If evolution from common ancestry is not true, and some flavor of special creation of different as yet unidentified kinds is true, then there would be some surface levels in the cladogram where you would accept an actual evolutionary ancestry. But there must also be subsequent levels in that twin-nested hierarchy where life forms would no longer be the same kind and wouldn't be biologically related anymore. At that point, they would be magically created separate kinds and distinctly unique from those listed around it, as well as those apparently ancestral to it. So, are Bengal tigers related to Burmese tigers and all other tiger species? Are all known species of tiger related to each other and all other panthers? Are all panthers related to felines, scimitar cats, and other felids? Are felids related to nymphorids or viverids? And how could we tell? Are all phylloidea related to any or all other members of the order carnivora? Those who promote creationism's bewildering inanity should be able to show exactly where and why uniquely created kinds could not be grouped together with any parent clades which would otherwise only imply an evolutionary ancestry. Throw away any other argument you might be thinking about. None of them compare to this. If creationism is true of anything more than a single ancestor of all animal forms, if not the entire eukaryote collective, or if the concept of common ancestry is fundamentally mistaken, then there must be a point in the tree where taxonomy falls apart, where what we thought was related to everything is really unrelated to anything else. And unless you're a Scientologist or Aurelian, that criteria must apply to other animals besides ourselves. So, is the short-tailed goanna related to the parenti and all other Australian goannas? Are all Australian goannas related to each other and to the African and Indonesian monitors? Are today's terrestrial varanids related to Cretaceous mosasaurs? Are varanids related to any other anguimorphs, including snakes? Are anguimorphs also related to skinkimorphs and geckos? Are all sclerogosa related to iguanids and other squamates? Are all of squamata related to each other and to all other lepidosaurs? Are all lepidosaurs related to placodonts and plesiosaurs? Are lepidosauromorphs related to archosaurs and other diapsids? Are all diapsids related to anapsids or synapsid reptiles like dimetrodon? Are all reptiles related to each other and all other amniotes? Are all amniotes related to each other and all other tetrapods? Are all tetrapods related to each other and all other vertebrates? And so on. Which of these are related? Which of these are created? Remember, if there's any validity to creationism whatsoever, or if there's some critical flaw in the overall theory of evolution from common ancestry, that flaw must be found here, or it simply can't be anywhere else.